Well, hello, everyone, and welcome to Lessons in Effective Peace Activism, Reflections on Norman Cousins' Life. My name is Bob Flax, and I'm the Executive Director of Citizens for Global Solutions. For those of you who are not familiar with us, CGS is a nonprofit affiliated with the United Nations and part of a worldwide network known as the World Federalist Movement. Perhaps the greatest achievement of our movement thus far is that we convened the 120 nations and countless NGOs that created the International Criminal Court. Our short-term goals are to strengthen and democratize the UN, strengthen international law, and create global institutions that solve our global problems better than what we're currently doing. In the longer term, we educate and advocate for the creation of a democratic world federation. I also wanna give a shout out to Peace Action and their New York State and Chicago chapters for both their vital work and also for being our promotional partners for this event. I originally heard of Norman Cousins, not through his work in the peace movement or even from being the editor in chief of the Saturday Review, but through a, a remarkable book that he wrote called The Anatomy of an Illness as Perceived by the Patient, in which he describes how he apparently cured himself of both a connective tissue disease and a type of arthritis by taking massive doses of vitamin C and watching massive amounts of comedy TV shows and movies like the Marx Brothers. And who said TV is bad for you? At the time, I was training as a psychologist with an interest in holistic medicine, and his writing was acclaimed as a pioneering work in how our attitudes can influence our health and well being. It was decades later when I got involved with Citizens for Global Solutions that I learned that the very same Norman Cousins, and I had to check a few times because I, I didn't believe it at first, um, had been the president of CGS twice. First from 1952 to 1954, and then again from 1976 to 1990. And that brings us to our guest speakers. Alan Pietroban is an assistant professor of global affairs at Trinity Washington University, where he chairs their global affairs department. He specializes in modern American history and US foreign policy. Since 2011, he has also served as an assistant director of research at the Nuclear Studies Institute. His forthcoming book, Norman Cousins, Peacemaker in the Cold War, explores the life of Norman Cousins, who is an especially effective citizen diplomat during the Cold War era. I'm also thrilled to be joined by Candace Cousins, a daughter of Norman Cousins, who is involved in the civil rights movement in the South during her years at Oberlin College. After attending the Bank Street School, she taught first grade in an all black school in Georgia before then returning north to begin her training in psychotherapy and learning disabilities. After receiving her PhD in clinical psychology, she had a private practice for 33 years. Now retired, Kansas, can, Candace, <laughs> excuse me, teaches studio art and a course in perception and creativity. She lives in Oakland, California with her husband, son, and daughter-in-law. Next, we'll hear from CGS board member and Peace Action board member, Larry Whitner. Larry is a historian and peace activist who taught at the State University of New York at Albany for more than three decades. He's the author of nine books, including the Struggle Against the Bomb trilogy, a history of the worldwide nuclear disarmament movement. He is the former editor of Peace and Change, a journal of peace research, and chaired the Peace History Commission of the International Peace Research Association. Larry's been an activist in the civil rights and social justice movements since the early 60s and received the Peace History Society's Lifetime Achievement Award in 2011. Okay. Just a few additional words of housekeeping before we turn to our speakers. First, there'll be a Q&A period following the three presenters. We'll get a chance to type your questions into the chat. They'll be collated and asked by our production team. 
You'll also hear from Donna Park, our board chair and timekeeper for this event, um, coming on from time to time to keep things on schedule and let us know when it's time to transition to the next speaker. And finally, after the panel and the Q&A, Drea Bergman, our programs and campaigns manager, will say a few words about, of course, our programs and campaigns. So now I'd like to introduce Alan Pietrobon. Alan? Thank you very much, uh, Bob and everyone, for that uh, generous introduction. I'm very excited to be here. I'm especially very excited that uh, Larry Whitner is here because in thinking back when I... It's impossible for me to remember now, but I'm pretty sure it was Dr. Whitner's work where I may have first encountered the first mention of Norman Cousins in your you know, wonderful work on the, the peace movement um, over all those years. But I wanna start, and I'll put some images up on your screen here. Um, I would like to start by saying, I did not plan this. I did not plan to spend what would amount to be 12 years writing this book, researching across six countries, to write a book about a man who spent his entire life arguing against the dangers of nuclear weapons, and have that book released this month, the same month where we have headlines about nuclear threats coming out of Russia today. I didn't plan to write a book at this moment um, in, in, in world history, when even apparently, according to those same headlines, President Biden is looking to the Cuban Missile Crisis uh, to figure out how to deal with this situation. Incidentally, the Cuban Missile Crisis ended today, 60 years ago. Wow. Um, and Norman Cousins, incidentally, was a key part of this event, deeply involved, but played a small part in helping to ease the two nuclear powers away from the brink of mutually assured destruction. And a year later, when Cousins would meet with Soviet Premier Nikita Khrushchev, uh, the Premier would tell him that his efforts during the missile crisis had, quote, carried considerable weight in my thinking, end quote, is what Khrushchev told him. And finally, um, I didn't plan to write a book about a man who spent a good portion of his adult life traveling the world to negotiate an end to wars, to provide humanitarian assistance to the victim of wars at a time when we are now in the largest land war in Europe since 1945. This is a man who was a tireless advocate for world government at a time when perhaps today it's most necessary to deal with these fraught political issues the world currently faces. And although I didn't plan any of that, it's just a coincidence that this all lined up with this book being released this month, in my humble opinion, this is a perfect moment to talk about Norman Cousins. Because I ended up writing about a generally quiet man, a man who never held political office, but who worked behind the scenes um, and admittedly through the public megaphone of the Saturday Review, but worked to have an immense and peaceful influence on US presidents and world leaders. Kennedy's national security advisor, McGeorge Bundy, once said that John F. Kennedy and Norman Cousins had an unusually close relationship for a journalist and a president. But whenever Kennedy had a big decision to make about global affairs, he would ask, what Norman Cousins thought about that issue. He wanted that input. So over the next 30, you know, 25 minutes now, I wanna do a couple of things. I'm sure if you're here, you might have at least some inkling of who Norman Cousins was, one of, as Bob mentioned, the presidents of the World Federalist Movement. Um, but of course, I wanna give a bit of background about his life and times. And then mostly I'd like to highlight a couple of the key contributions that Cousins made to the world, because while he is strongly identified with world federalism, he also did a lot more. So I'll tell a few stories about the impact he had. And I do all of this, and I you know, engaged in writing this book over 12 years, because I believe that Norman Cousins is one of those rare few people who truly made the world a better, safer, more peaceful place. In a time, even today, but even in his time, when countries all too often default to threats of force and violence, 
um, in pursuing their foreign policy goals, I wanted to explore the efforts of a private citizen who worked for global peace, who believed in the strength of dialogue over the power of force. And so let me start with some brief but necessary background. Norman Cousins, born in New Jersey, a number of miles outside Manhattan in 1915. He launches uh, um, his working life, first writing for a plumbing magazine, then working as a book reviewer. But what he would later say is that of his generation, some of their first memories were of fathers and uncles and older brothers who didn't return from World War I. And so he starts off in the publishing world a little bit, but then starting in 1940, he becomes the editor of the Saturday Review of Literature, which at the time was a small sort of stuffy New York City literature review that was financially struggling, that had a readership of around 20,000 subscribers. So very small circulation. And here's Norman Cousins, just 25 years old, a stuttering kid from New Jersey without an official college education. By his own admission, he said that he got his college in bits and pieces, but never officially graduated. He was doing this through the height of the Great Depression, and there's some indication that um, the family and he couldn't afford to sort of go to the traditional four years of college. But here he is offered the job of editor of this magazine, partly because by his own admission, no one else would take the job. No one of any stature wanted to join this small, financially struggling magazine at the time. But hiring Cousins was, in my opinion, the best decision the Saturday Review ever made because Cousins would go on to uh, uh, become the chief of this magazine, would lead it for nearly 35 years, and under his direction would eventually reformat it from a literature review into a more of a news magazine covering the biggest global political issues of its day. And under his leadership, the magazine would grow from 20,000 subscribers and near bankruptcy in 1940 to, by the late 1960s, over 700,000 subscribers, putting it ahead of the New Yorker magazine. This is one of the most influential magazines of that era. And many subscribers would write that they subscribed almost exclusively to read Cousins' weekly editorials, where he opined on the big issues of the day. And so as such, in the book, I argue that he is one of the more influential people on American public thought through the early to mid Cold War. As I mentioned earlier, John F. Kennedy wanted to know his opinions, but even before that, President Eisenhower too would frequently write to Cousins saying that he had read one of his recent editorials and circulated it among his staff so they could get the benefit of his thinking. But perhaps for the audience here, it's also good to know that Eisenhower too was interested in world government, especially in those early years after World War II before he became president. But after he took office, Cousins would write him letters and try to tease him out more on that topic in the 1950s, would remind him, hey, remember when you wrote your World War II memoir, Crusade in Europe, and you said you supported world government? Maybe you should say more about that as president. Which is sort of funny, because in 1945, when Albert Einstein would come to befriend Norman Cousins, it was Einstein who, during their first meeting, would implore Cousins to be more bold about championing world federalism. Eisenhower was a big, or sorry, uh, Einstein was a big believer in this movement as well. But what put Norman Cousins on the public radar so much so that even Albert Einstein, the preeminent physicist, is reaching out to meet Cousins, what put him on the radar was what happened at 8.15 a.m. on August 6th, 1945, when a single bomb, uh, a single plane carrying a single bomb would change the world forever. When the United States used an atomic bomb on the city of Hiroshima, the co-pilot of that plane, Robert Lewis, after watching a radius of four miles of this city you know, disappear in an instant, he's reported to have said, my God, what have we done? 
And yet, in a survey taken that same month, 85% of Americans expressed approval of using a nuclear weapon against Japan. It said that that's what ended the war in the Pacific. It's what brought peace to the world. It's what forced the Japanese to surrender. And so the atomic bomb was largely celebrated at the time. But Norman Cousins was one of the early few who thought differently. When he first learned about the use of the bomb the following morning, the effect it had on him was cataclysmic. He would later write, quote, I felt scalded. I had a feeling that a curtain had dropped on human history and a new curtain was going up and no one quite knew what the script would be, uh, end quote. That same day, he was scheduled to give a speech about the war. He, he had done uh, the public lecture circuit during the war, largely as a booster of the war, of, of arguing that Americans should stay engaged, should, should argue for defeating Germany. And he went before that audience of businessmen at the Waldorf Astoria. He scrapped his boosterism speech, and he talked about how he thought the atomic bomb was a horrible decision. This was not a moment of elation. And that evening, he went home and felt compelled to write an article arguing that this powerful new weapon was not a good thing. He publishes that editorial, Modern Man is Obsolete, which was sent out 18 days later to those 20,000 subscribers. I should, I should say, by 1945, 22,000 subscribers. They gained 2,000 over the previous couple of years. Um, and this article, my point here is, it should have gone nowhere. Right, It's a small circulation New York magazine. But in this article, Cousins articulated this sense of unease that many felt. The article in today's term, we might say it went viral. And ultimately, it was read by an estimated 40 million people. It's what launched his public career. And to, to summarize, in this article, he basically predicts what's going to happen. That the atomic bombing of Japan should not be a moment of elation, we should consider it a moment of fear. For number one, even though the U.S. government uh, uh, was arguing alternately that it would take at least five years up to 20 years before anyone else got an atomic bomb, Cousins put forward that this weapon would not stay a secret. Never in history has a new weapon not very quickly been overtaken by other weapons. And that would, number two, lead to an arms race between nations. Number three, nations who got these weapons would use them to threaten and blackmail other countries. And therefore, number four, we would live in fear of other countries developing nuclear weapons. And finally, eventually these weapons, while right now in 1945 can eliminate, you know, can vaporize part of a city, they will eventually get so powerful, they'll be able to wipe out humanity. And the final thing, maybe for our purposes here, um, that he articulated in this article is that atomic weapons made national sovereignty obsolete. That the idea of mass national armies standing on borders to protect nations, that's a thing of the past. Atomic weapons cannot be easily defended against in this old way. Atomic bombs instantly revolutionized warfare and he argued, we now needed to revolutionize our thinking, especially revolutionize our way of governing ourselves in order to prevent wars between nations in the first place. That in order to control atomic force, what we would need going forward was a global centralized government, which would be the only thing powerful enough to stop uh, the path down to war and arms races that he was predicting. That only world federalism could abolish war before a future war abolished all of us. And so in 1950, Cousins wrote and started informing his family members that he was considering putting aside his writing career at Saturday Review in order to concentrate full time on peace and world government through this organization, the United World Federalists an organization that, as Bob hinted at, he would come to be president of two years later in 1952. He believed that 
world federalism was an issue that he said was, quote, central to the welfare of the American people. And at the time, it seemed promising. In 1949, membership had swelled to nearly 720 chapters nationwide. Um, in June 1949, 91 members of the U.S. House of Representatives tendered a resolution supporting World Federation as a, quote, fundamental objective of U.S. foreign policy. There seemed to be real momentum towards this as people started grappling with what atomic weapons would mean in, for the future of governance. But as it so often does, war changes everything. And with the outbreak of the Korean War in 1950 and the attending anti-communism and McCarthyism, membership started to plummet as world federalism got lumped in with, you know, communist tendencies. But despite this, Cousins believed so strongly in the initiative that to sort of to try to counter the, the falling in membership and thus, you know, decline in membership dues, he would donate uh, over a period of years today's equivalent of nearly $600,000 uh, to keep this organization afloat. His secretary would later write that he did it because he found in this group a commonality of spirit and dedication to the movement that matched his own. But from 1945 on, Cousins would spend basically the rest of his life traveling the world, meeting with global leaders, um, negotiating and advocating not just against nuclear weapons, but advocating for war victims um, who had been uh, mistreated by governments. Because even if we didn't ultimately get a, a, a world government like he envisioned, Cousins still deeply believed that when a national government failed in its duty to protect its citizens or to atone for its past mistakes, then it was the responsibility of the individual to step up and force that government to change its policies. And to run through the checklist of just a few of the things he, he got involved in over the years. In 1949, he traveled to uh, Hiroshima, where he witnessed a number of orphans around and was told that these were the kids who were orphaned by you know, their parents being killed in the atomic bomb. And so he set up a program called the Moral Adoptions, that Americans would pay some money and a monthly fee to help care for these orphans, help put them through school, help get them a better life. Following on that, in 1955, also based out of Hiroshima, he would uh, come to discover that there were a number of women who had survived the blast but were left uh, um, disfigured. Um, nuclear weapons uh, cause burns that are incredibly difficult to treat and heal. Um, and the U.S. government, he discovered, was studying these injuries, but was by policy not treating them. Um, they wanted to, to continue to see how these injuries would progress in case we needed uh, uh, to deal with them in an atomic attack against us. And Cousins thought that a doctor who studied uh, an illness or an injury and then didn't treat it was a violation of their oath. So he launched, uh, long story short, the Hiroshima Maidens to bring these women to the United States where they could get medical treatment, specifically advanced plastic surgery um, that was not being provided in Japan, and ultimately got Japan uh, uh, to change their policy and start funding treatments for people who were affected by the atomic bomb. In Moving along the list, in 1957, he would co-found what would later become one of the most effective anti-nuclear um, um, lobbying and protest organizations um, in the United States. In 1959, he would do a similar medical program when he came to uh, be informed that there were women from Poland who were affected by Nazi medical experiments, that the German, the new West German government was refusing to provide treatment or payment for, and he got that changed, uh, forced the German government to change that policy by bringing this to public light. Then we have as I hinted at, 1962, the Cuban Missile Crisis, where at that very moment, he happened to be hosting a conference that brought together scientists and cultural leaders and politicians from both the United States and the Soviet Union to discuss global disarmament and these governments working together. 
It was perhaps one of the only places in the world where high level Americans and Soviets were together in the same room when the missile crisis broke out. And so tapping into his contacts there, he spoke with an attendee who had ties to the Vatican, uh, which ultimately got Pope John to issue a statement urging for peace. He then reached out to the Kremlin and the White House and tried to get them talking to each other. And he briefly became the personal liaison in this moment to three of the most powerful men in the world, a key uh, conciliatory presence during the missile crisis. As I mentioned, um, Khrushchev would later say that his actions carried considerable weight in Khrushchev's thinking. 1969, there would be a war that broke out in a country then called Biafra that caused a famine that were uh, was, was starving millions of children that Cousins launched an aid effort to uh, provide aid to the Biafran children. He also flew into the combat zone to negotiate directly with the two parties um, and try to get them to resolve the conflict as he flew back and forth across the front lines in this sort of daring, harrowing moment. But I think the most important thing he did in you know, bringing uh, uh, peace to the world, a moment where he may literally have helped reduce the arms race, was with the limited nuclear test ban treaty of 1963. And to, to bring my portion uh, uh, to a bit of a conclusion here, to just briefly set the scene, in 1961, John F. Kennedy enters the White House. And today we sort of have this image of Kennedy as a man of peace, an inspiring president trying to end the Cold War. That's not entirely true. During his election campaign, he positioned himself as an aggressive and militaristic Cold Warrior claiming that the U.S. was falling behind the Soviet Union, that we needed to build more nuclear weapons and nuclear missiles. Kennedy, though, was lying about that. He had seen the presidential briefing, the confidential briefing that the president gets. He knew that there was an imbalance, but at the time, the U.S. had a nine-to-one advantage over the Soviets in total nuclear weapons. But the American people believed Kennedy because all they ever saw was these military parades, the propaganda about this aggressive Soviet Union trying to take over the world. But after he was elected, to prove his toughness as part of his inaugural parade, John F. Kennedy had a fleet of military vehicles, you might be able to see in the video here, carrying U.S. nuclear missiles parading down Pennsylvania Avenue to show that we are going to stand up to the Soviets. It's this sort of attitude that partly led to the Cuban Missile Crisis, which at least deeply scared both Kennedy and Khrushchev. And in the days after and weeks and months after, they were looking for a way to dial down the arms race, but were still at loggerheads. The US and the Soviet Union had been working for about six years to try to sign a treaty that would ban the testing of nuclear weapons. But in this fraught, tense atmosphere after the missile crisis, uh, the talks had broken off. Uh, it seemed to be falling apart. And in this moment, it was Norman Cousins who stepped up, who used his connection to Kennedy, and essentially, to very much simplify here, said, hey, send me to the Soviet Union. I've got this connection with Khrushchev. We've met, met uh, once before. I think I, as a private citizen speaking from the heart, can clear up this misunderstanding in a way that politicians and their entrenched positions can't. And so Kennedy says, okay. And Cousins departs for Russia in April 1963 with his two daughters, or two of his daughters, Candace, who's with us here and might you know, have some thoughts on this, and, and Andrea. Um, they arrive, they meet with Khrushchev. You see him uh, uh, here. Maybe I can sort of uh, annotate this. This is Nikita Khrushchev. We've got their translator. We've got uh, a young Candace and Andrea here. Um, he, uh, Khrushchev ushers them inside to have lunch. There's brandy and wine flowing. They <laughs> play a game of badminton together. Um, they go for a walk. As lunch comes to an end, Candace and Andrea go to, uh, for a swim in the pool because Khrushchev and cousins need to have a meeting now. 
And Cousins finds Khrushchev after this like jovial lunch and they're chatting and, and, and spending this time together, ultimately spending seven hours together, which was just astonishing. When they sit down to meet, Cousins finds Khrushchev angry and suspicious. Um, but ultimately, Cousins manages to break through to them, uh, to, to Khrushchev. And Khrushchev agrees, I am willing to give this another chance, but Kennedy has to be the one to make the next step. Long story short, uh, Cousins returns, has a meeting with Kennedy in the Oval Office, explains what Khrushchev is thinking, that he does, he's acting genuinely, he does want this, but that Kennedy needs to respond with something bold. But a month goes by and nothing happens. In fact, things seem to be slipping away. And so Cousins does something bold himself. He writes John F. Kennedy a letter, kind of telling the president that he's doing it wrong, <laughs> that you've got to take this moment. This is the moment to uh, reach out to the Soviets, specifically to write a speech recognizing them and, and proposing peace. Um, and Kennedy agrees, running out of options, deciding to take a risk. Kennedy embraces Cousins' idea, asks him to help write this speech that would become probably Kennedy's second most famous speech, not the one, ask not what you can do for your country, but the one where he talks about how the U.S. doesn't just want peace in our time, but peace for all time. And the speech would later be called the most remarkable speech by a U.S. president in the Cold War era because it broke from the mold of aggression. It broke from the mold of propaganda and stereotypes about the Soviet Union. It um, worked because Cousins, a peace activist, a man who argued for better relations, even with adversaries, even in fraught, tense times, Cousins recognized that in a moment defined by the overwhelming power of nuclear weapons, sometimes the most powerful weapon of all is that strength of dialogue. And the final point here is it worked. When Nikita Khrushchev heard that speech, that the aggressive American attitude had shifted, that Kennedy had extended the olive branch, he agreed to sign the partial or limited nuclear test ban treaty, one of the first and most effective anti-nuclear treaties um, between the US and the Soviet Union. And so in this book, we uh, I detail a number of these uh, cousins' missions, his visions about world government, about peace, about abolishing nuclear weapons and dialing down aggressive rhetoric. Um, and I wrote this book because I think like many of you, hopefully here, he inspired me. We, we've sort of um, need more of these voices, which is why I'm so glad to be here chatting with some of the people who work on these similar issues uh, uh, today to bring more peace uh, uh, to the world. So I'll, uh, I'll end uh, uh, my portion on, on that point, uh, but I appreciate you giving me this opportunity to chat about this book. <laughs> Thank you so much, Alan, for that wonderful and fascinating history. Um, I have two quick announcements before I move on. First, I'm delighted to announce that the entire US delegation to the Soviet Union is with us now because Andrea Cousins has joined the, June, the, the Zoom call as well. So we have the whole delegation here. I haven't been able to get Nikita Khrushchev, that's a little tougher, uh, but we do have the rest of the delegation. And also I wanna point out that earlier, Alan mentioned the name United World Federalists. Um, we've had about four names in our 75 year history. So that was an earlier name. So not to confuse you, Citizens for Global Solutions is the current iteration of, of the same organization. So thank you. And with that, I will move on to Candace Cousins. Hello, everybody. I have been asked to talk about how my father became a peacemaker in the atomic age. And I do have some observations about my father and I offer them to you as just one example of peacemaking. Um, as we know, peacemaking has been a part of society throughout history. Um, many of you probably know about um, the play Lysistrata by Aristophanes that was performed in Athens in, 
in 411 BC. And it's a story of one woman's effort to end the Peloponnesian War. Her name was Lysistrata. And, her, and what she did was she persuaded these women in the other city states that were warring with Athens to deny sex to their husbands and lovers until they, um, they were negotiating at the peace table. And um, so um, I, um, I think that's a, actually a great method and we, sh and, we, and we should keep it in mind. Um, so in terms of how my father became um, who he was, I, I, think, I think it's a mystery. It, it's just a mystery how any of us became who we became. But I, I do know, and I so appreciate Alan's really well-researched and well-written book about my father, because I learned so much about my father, because I was I was a little girl growing up. I didn't know what my father was doing. And now I found, and now I know so much more about him and what was happening in this country. So as Alan described, when the Americans obliterated the city of Hiroshima with the dropping of the atomic bomb on August 6, 1945, 66 by some estimates and there, you know, their estimates you know, are not in line with each other, but by some estimates, 66,000 people were killed immediately. 69,000 people were injured. Approximately 24,700 people were killed per square mile. With that atomic explosion, my father, and here's one of the mysteries, somehow understood that the arc of history would never be the same. And that we had been set on a new and perilous course. And our control over the unleashing of this destructiveness was in question. And I, you know, I was, this was a month before I was born and I wish I could somehow go back and talk to my father as he read about this in the paper and be with him. And I don't know whether he knew in that moment, whether his life and the life of our family would never be the same. As it sometimes happens, brilliant leaders look like unlikely prospects for brilliant leaderships in their earlier years. As we know, Franklin Roosevelt was a moderate, well-to-do, blue, blue blood guy who was a bit of a dandy, who became the architect of the New Deal. And Moses, was a person who didn't grow up with other Jews. He grew up, as we know, in the, as the story goes, in the Pharaoh's palace, and then had to flee the Pharaoh's palace because he had murdered somebody. He murdered one of the Pharaoh's guards who had killed an elderly Jewish slave. And yet he was God's choice to um, lead the Israelites out of Egypt. But when God told him, you're my choice to lead the Israelites out of Egypt. Moses says, I don't want the job. Yet he became, well, what can I say? He became Moses. <laughs> and so it was, in my opinion, this way for my father. He was a skinny kid who wasn't a gifted student, nor was he a gifted athlete. He was very sadly rejected by the City University of New York twice. And I really wish I could go back and bop those admissions people in the nose, um, but he was rejected twice. And he never received a college degree, even though he was a very authentic and committed intellectual. And also he stuttered 
into his 30s. My uncle tells me that when I was born, my father was still stuttering. But he had many gifts. He was charming. He was charismatic. He was terribly funny. He was articulate. He was creative. He was artistic. He was musical. He was inspired by his own failures. He was drawn to people who disagreed with him because he believed that what we share, what we all share, which is the desire to love, the desire to be loved, the desire to have meaningful lives, and of course, the desire to survive is far stronger and deeper than what divides us. And he committed himself to reasoning with people to help them see what it was that joined us all together. And of course, my father was a person who banked his entire life on his vision. He would stand upon his vision when there was no evidence for what he believed. And he would continue to stand on that vision, speaking with such music, such reason, such passion that people began to gather to read what he wrote and to listen to what he was saying as he worked to help them see that we can save the world. We can save the world from nuclear disaster. We can't leave it up to our governments. It is our individual responsibility. Another one of my father's gifts, which deepened over time, was his remarkable ability to be on intimate terms with what the world would look like after a nuclear explosion. He had walked the streets of Hiroshima and he had looked long into the scarred faces of survivors. He had spoken, he spoke with scientists, he read scientific papers and he read many personal accounts. He immersed himself as a matter of conscience and passion in the reality, in the horrors of nuclear war, knowing that it's a greater and greater possibility if we choose to do nothing. And yet, even though he was so immersed in the reality of nuclear war, he remained optimistic. He was able to hold both at once. He never, to my view, stopped believing that there is a way we can save ourselves from nuclear holocaust. But it's something that doesn't exist. We have to create it and we have to continue to create it. And we can only create it together. As my father said over and over, it's late, but it's not too late. My father was also very lucky. There were three women in his life who made his work possible. His mother believed in him, saw greatness in him, and among other things, made efforts to protect him from the anti-Semitism of the day. In my father's early 20s, as, as Alan mentioned, he worked on small journals. And one of these journals was in the same building as the Saturday Review of Literature. And at that time, there were just three editors, three founders of the Saturday Review of Literature. And here was my father. He was, you know, you saw this picture of him. He was, you know, he wasn't a very big man. He didn't have a huge physical presence that was commanding. And as we've said, he was stuttering. He didn't have a college education, but he really took to these three elderly founders of the Saturday Review. He carried boxes for them. He set type for them. But most of all, he spent time trying to get to know them. And one of these editors was a woman named Amy Loveman. And Amy Loveman was an unmarried Jewish, um, highly liter literate, highly educated woman who I think saw in my father 
great possibilities, maybe that he hadn't even seen for himself. And she took him under her wing and taught him to write and to edit and put him up on the masthead as editor, even before, to my father's own admission, he was really ready. So the other person, most of all, most of all, was my mother. There's a story about my parents that Andrea, my sister, just reminded me of. It's, this, it's a story that, as Andrea says, captures an important aspect of my parents' relationship with each other. My parents were adventurous and they loved to get lost together on country roads and you know, driving, driving around. One day they were in a truck um, in some mountainous dirt roads in Southern Arizona. Is that right, Andrea? Right. And they encountered some boulders in the road but the road was too narrow and they couldn't turn around. So my father, remains in the driver's seat and my mother gets out and moves the boulders. And this is, I think, such a good picture of how it was between them, that my mother cleared the path for my father's journey and made everything possible. So what would my father want me to say to you today. I think he'd say, enough about me. You know, talk, find out about the people you're talking to. And I really do want to find out, as I know there are many peacemakers here. And we do need to find each other. This is a great opportunity, this moment on this Zoom, to find each other and to find ways to work together to support each other. And there are these wonderful organizations that we can join if we haven't joined already. Citizens for Global Solutions, Peace Action, United World Federalists, Plowshares, Win Without War, just to name a few. And perhaps we can set up Zoom meetings in order to educate and inspire each other because we really can't do this alone. We can, you know, one thing I was thinking about this morning is that we, if everybody on this Zoom, after the Zoom is over, sits down and writes Biden a letter and write or writes congressional representatives a letter pleading with them to call for a ceasefire immediately. Wouldn't that be great? My father always said never to underestimate the power of a letter to somebody in power. I think my father would say that Alan's subtitle well describes a possibility within each of us. Each of us has different gifts, different limitations, and a different path. But all of us, all of us can become peacemakers in the nuclear age. Thank you. Well, th thank you, Candace, for your wonderful and heartfelt sharing about your father. That was very moving. Thank you. So at this time, I'd like to invite Larry Whitner to take the microphone. Larry. Uh, thank you, Bob. Um, for most of his life, Norman Cousins was not only a strong advocate of World Federation, but a, a prominent leader of the World Federalist Movement. In the midst of the international anarchy and widespread violence of World War II, uh, Cousins was drawn to World Federation as a logical path toward peace. In his first book, uh, Good Inheritance, uh, published in 1942, he emphasized the tragic inability of the city-states of uh, classical Greece to form a federation, as well as the success of the United States in, in transforming a weak confederation of states 
into a federal union. Writing in the Saturday Review of Literature in 1943, Cousins championed what he called world citizenship. But as has been mentioned, it was the shock of the atomic bombing of Japan that convinced Cousins that creating world federation was imperative for human survival. The need for world government was clear before August 6, 1945, he wrote, but Hiroshima and Nagasaki raised that need to such uh, dimensions that it can no longer be ignored. National sovereignty, he said, was preposterous now. In the following months, he went on barnstorming tours with leading atomic scientists, including Albert Einstein, who, who shared uh, Cousins' uh, world government views to alert the public to the terrible nuclear dangers. He also met with other uh, prominent Americans at Dublin, New Hampshire, uh, from which they issued a statement calling for a quote, a world federal government with limited but definite and, and ad adequate powers to prevent war. In February 1947, with the movement spreading rapidly, five US world government groups met in Asheville, North Carolina, and banded together to form United World Federalists. Uh, Cousins was elected the new organization's vice president, and in the early 1950s, served as its president. For a time, as ha has been mentioned, uh, world federalism enjoyed a considerable popularity around the world. In the United States, in mid-1949, United World Federalists had nearly uh, 47,000 members in uh, 720 chapters. The idea of transforming the United Nations into a world federation was endorsed by uh, 45 important national organizations, including the General Federation of Women's Clubs, the National Grange, the United Auto Workers, and numerous religious bodies. Uh, 20 state legislatures passed resolutions endorsing world government. But um, for a variety of reasons, uh, the movement declined over the years. Um, Cousins, though, uh, remained steadfast by uh, supporting World Federation in articles and, and books, speeches he delivered or drafted uh, for U.S. presidents, and by uh, continued leadership of the movement. Of course, uh, Cousins devoted himself to numerous other ventures as well, but he helped to infuse these with World Federalist ideas, ideas of moving beyond the national interests to the human interest of fostering world citizenship and of, of bringing an end to war. He also swept activists from the World Federalist Movement into his new uh, crusades. When it came to the National Committee for Sane Nuclear Policy, which Cousins co-founded and later co-chaired for years, he brought with, with him uh, former officers of United World Federalists, like Walter Ruther, and uh, former uh, UWF staffers like Donald Keyes, who became SANE's executive director. The relationship between the two organizations was so close that SANE and United World Federalists explored the possibility of merger, although that project never came to uh, fruition. Cousins never abandoned his World Federalist beliefs. And from 1976 to the year of his death, 1990, served as a president of United World Federalist Successor, the World Federalist Association. Citizens for Global Solutions, of course, is the successor to the World Federalist Association and is delighted to recall the enormous accomplishments of Norman Cousins, whose vision of a peaceful, democratically governed world we continue to champion today. Great, thank you so much, Larry, for your thoughts and also for your wonderful work in helping CGS get its voice out into literally hundreds of media outlets. Um, just to let folks know, um, Larry heads what we call our breaking news response team and helps coach us all into writing op-eds that go into literally hundreds of online 
um, you know, both online and uh, hard copy uh, media outlets. So thank you so much for that. So before we get to your questions, Candace and Alan will share their thoughts on how we could move this vital work together. And at this time, if you have a question, you may begin to type them into the chat um, and our production team will collate them and ask them um, when we're done. Okay, Candace, Alan, you're on. Candace, why don't you get us started? <laughs> okay. Um, I'd really like to hear, I know that there are so many peacemakers on this call and I'd really like to hear what people are involved in and what suggestions they might have for the rest of us to get involved and to live more in line with our conscience by getting involved. So um, Stanley, Harsha, are you on? Oh yeah, I'm here, yeah. Okay. Stan Stanley um, is um, someone I'm, he's a relation actually. He's, He's my daughter-in-law's father, but Stanley um, had, a, had a career in the State Department, but just recently, Stanley has been doing what I would call some peacemaking work locally. Stan, could you just describe a little bit about what you've been doing? Yeah, so um, I retired from the Foreign Service and I go back and forth between Colorado and Asia, but um, I started with the Rotary Club, local Rotary Club, um, the peace building committee and club and started a peace building club in our community here in Conifer with the idea that there's a divide between blue and red here. And so uh, we built a peace park. Uh, we're, we're taking the, the Center for Nonviolent Communications course where we're, we and a lot of people in our community here and the nearby community are taking that course so that we can have find, have the skills to have a dialogue with people that we that we that we disagree with, and um, you know I, I'm involved with uh, the world world beyond war, that that movement and that and that course, and uh, that's everything that they stand for is exactly what Norman Cousins and everybody here here stands for. And and the one thing I noticed in taking that course was that they did not have enough stories about individuals, ordinary people, stories who are not told, small organizations that have stopped conflict and, and achieved peace. And so what I wanna do now is I wanna go back and, and find some of the people that I know made tremendous contributions to that, but without it being publicized and like write an article as a way to, to, way to inspire individuals for how they can also uh, at, at a, at a local level, um, prevent conflict and achieve peace. So that's what that's what we're doing here. That is so great. That is so great. I mean, it's it's really the task of inspiration. How do we inspire ourselves and others to take action? So, um, are there who else? I know there are other peacemakers. Many. Could somebody else talk a little bit about maybe some organization they're involved in and, or some peacemaking efforts? Yeah, this is David Evans. I'd just like to make a couple of comments. <clears throat> I was on the board of directors of World Federalist Association for about 15 years in the late 60s through the 70s. At, at one point, uh, Norman Cousins had 52 honorary doctorates. <clears throat> so even though he didn't have a, a college degree, he did have a lot of doctors. Secondly, he was pretty much known as uh, the intellectuals intellectual. Um, those, those are my two comments. Hmm. I hadn't heard that about, um, Andrea, had you heard that description of him? No, <clears throat> it was an accurate description. Oh. <laughs> so, I said, I hadn't heard it, but I like it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thank you, David. Is it is is, is someone else? Could someone else? Well, Andrew, I'll, I'll just jump in to um uh, to put in a, a distinction here. Um, it's the analysis of the World Federalist Movement that it's really the way the world governs itself, 
that leads to war, as well as the other problems we have, violations of human rights, pandemics you can't control, et cetera, et cetera. So we feel that that's the level and essentially the root cause that we have to work for, which is what we describe as our longer term goal. In the interim, there are all kinds of things you could do within the current system. And many, many organizations are focusing on those and we are as well. Um, but again, what we're trying to get to is essentially having a democratically elected global parliament with the world constitution, bill of rights, and all the other structures that you need to not only handle this war or that war, but to abolish the system that generates war. So that's what we're looking at as our long-term goal. And in the shorter range, we are definitely supporting all kinds of treaties, um, global institutions, et cetera, et cetera, um, that will handle this situation or that situation. But again, we are looking for getting at the root cause. Um, so just wanted to put that distinction in. All are vital and you know, God bless all the groups that are working at every angle. Thank you. Bob, I'm wondering what you think about the idea of um, a united, uh, united federalism of peace organizations. Well, not only do I, I think fondly about the idea, but that's one of our initiatives. Uh, actually, Larry Whitner uh, proposed that, that we reach out to the other peace organizations um, to align. Um, with our first step in that was joining um, the Alliance of Peace Builders, which is, which is a coalition of peace building networks. And we are now working through them uh, to do just what you're suggesting. Well, that's and and I, I wanted to give you, the, I'm a lowly but loyal board member of Citizens for Global Solutions for the last 15 or 16 years. Uh, and, I, and I think my life is a bit of a portrait of, um, of, 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 of some of the peace organizations that exist now and used to. Um, I um, was a board member of SANE when it merged with the Freeze before it became Peace Action. I was um, uh, marching against the Vietnam War and uh, very, very active in trying to end that war. Um, which took way too long and was unnecessary to begin with. And um, later, I, 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 I worked on um, Global Security Institute. Uh, John Pike was uh, doing satellite photography to figure out uh, that we had that there were no weapons of mass destruction in Iraq and that it was and that an invasion was stupid. And he was on both ABC News frequently, as well as Fox, and uh, but to no avail. And um, so, let's see. I worked on an Earth Charter, which was an initiative originally uh, propagated by Gorbachev and um, uh, various people here in our country, and. Um, and uh, Stephen Rockefeller took it up and we met for three years in Assisi, home of St. Francis to work on a, an earth charter, which would have abolished war. And, you know, and it's still around. It just hasn't moved forward with the enthusiasm that it, that it deserved. Um, and uh, we all did community summits around the country. I did one at my University of New England. Um, getting people to speak out and and I'm probably forgetting about 15 other initiatives that I've been involved in <laughs> women women on war was a traveling exhibition of of um, photographs that I, I I mounted around the country uh, after our Iraq invasion and um, I, yeah, I'm an, I'm a small example of I think one of the people who, 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 who has had an instinct. I went to your father's memorial service in New York mm -hmm. uh, when he died, and with with uh, the man who's I worked for for many, many, many years until he died, Stuart Mott, um, and uh, he gave away money for peace and 
the abolition of nuclear war and was a big fan of Norman Cousins. So um, this has been in my blood for most of my life. Mm -hmm. And I uh, think that, you know, I'm the old person, but, 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 but I'm very interested in trying to get young people. And I have four daughters, some, one of whom is quite young still. And and you know engaged, and 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 using social media and all the other wiles of our time to um, to um, build a new movement, because this is this is part of saving the planet. It's mm -hmm. an extremely important part of saving the planet and growing our own brains to be able to get beyond war as a solution to anything. Yes, thank you so much, Anne. That was so inspiring. Thanks, Anne. Um, Candace, this is Donna. I just wanted to point out the time is sort of up for this section. I don't know if Alan was going to say anything, but I see that uh, Ron and Lee Davis have their hand raised too. But I just wanted to point out our time challenge. Yeah, I, I can wrap up briefly, sort of connecting these together with what, you know, um, what was it Stanley began with, which was part of what got me into history and studying foreign policy and, and, and peacemaking is what Stanley mentioned that like so much of history and, and big political decisions are the men behind the flags that the United Nations are the, the big structural issues. But I believe that ordinary people can do extraordinary things that change history. And Connecting to, I think it's Anne there and getting young people involved. What I teach my students, I actually use Cousins as an example. When he would interview global leaders, he would ask them a simple question. He would say, in your lifetime, what have you learned? And he asked that to Kennedy, who said, uh, I love his quote, that you can always tell the real value of an advisor, not by the answers he gives you, but by the questions you haven't thought of yourself. But he really... Uh, the thing that struck home is he asked the famed humanitarian Albert Schweitzer, who said, I think I've learned that if you have something important to do, don't expect people to roll stones out of your way, like <laughs> your mother Candace and the boulders. But, you know, but his point was, um, he said, regardless of what you do, you should make your life your argument. And that's, I think, what Cousins did, which can be really hard in you know, a moment where there's violence and hate and fear and cynicism. But then you remember that you know, your father, too, lived through the Great Depression, through World War II, through the atomic bombing, you know, witnessed the Holocaust. But instead of being dragged down by the cynics, as you mentioned, he maintained his optimism. And so I tell my students, like, the first step is to make your life your argument and then share that wisdom with the world, right? So I'll, 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 pa I'll pause on that note. We just, um, Donna, would it be okay if we heard from Shirley and Gail? Would that be okay? Well, we, we, we are into the Q&A period uh, and because of the number of people we have here, oh. we, we have set it up so that people would write their questions in the chat. And then, because uh, there'll be a number of similar questions and then Drea will ask the questions. Um, so that's how we've designed the time, and we are now in the Q&A period. So yeah. if you haven't already, um, please put your questions in the chat. We have our system worked out. They're being compiled uh, by Donna and Drea, and uh, Drea will ask them momentarily. I'll take this off. I can't. I can actually start asking some questions that have yes, already please. been submitted yes, here. Please. Okay, so uh, question number one, I understand that Norman Cousins, you know, we've talked about this being this go between Kennedy and uh, Khrushchev and, and Pope John the 23rd during the Cuban Missile Crisis of 1962. So that next year in 1963, Pope John XXIII issued his encyclical Peace on Earth, in which he called for public authority for a world community to solve worldwide problems facing the world. So, you know, Alan, have you, uh, in your all of your extensive research, um, there, 
are other words calling for world federation on this. Um, so all the popes since John the 23rd have voiced support for this idea. So the question is that th this um, belief was planted by Norman Cousins to the Pope in the course of his discussions with him. Do you have any indication that that is true? Cousins, you know, one of the people he met with was the Pope uh, shortly before he died um, on one of the either outbound or inbound trips for, uh, to the Soviet Union. They stopped over in Rome. Um, you know, whether Cousins was the person who planted that idea, I, I couldn't tell you for certain. The Vatican archives are closed, so that is not one of the places I was able to get research from. Um, but we, I certainly do know they talked about this and that Pope John wanted to be a new sort of Pope. He didn't want the antagonism between uh, the Soviet Union. He was trying to open up uh, uh, the Vatican to the Soviets. The I do know Cousins did get a connection discussing having Vatican representation in the Soviet Union, um, which I don't think ultimately went anywhere, but Khrushchev was open to that and they had some meetings about it. Um, and yeah, the Pope wanted to have larger connections to the larger world. Um, what Cousins did, again, I don't know if convinced him of, but talked to him about is that like, actually, you know, President Kennedy is in control of what was the US population, 180 million at the time, the Soviets were around the same-ish, but the Pope controls far more people, not controls, but like has the influence of far more people as like Catholics around the world, that the most powerful person in spreading these ideas is actually the Pope, which is why Cousins thought his first connection in the Cuban Missile Crisis should be Pope John, that he'll reach a lot more people, Catholics around the world, um, than national leaders can. So in a way, he is sort of the chair of this like global governance organization, um, if you want to stretch it that far. Yeah. <laughs> Mm. Great. Thank you, Alan. And then, you know, we have a number of questions actually about, you know, that time period. So then the second one along those lines, um, that Cousins access to both Kennedy and Khrushchev seems remarkable today, especially when we're looking at the USG bureaucracy um, and that the leaders are more protected by layers of staff and undemocratic structures. So are there enlightened public intellectuals that have access to these leaders today and that argue for anything other than tax cuts and corporations? Um, yeah, that, I, that's also one of my questions as well. Sure, I can take a stab at that. I mean, one of the things that is remarkable, as the questioner mentioned, is this moment in time where like, you know, I keep referring to Cousins as like a regular citizen, but he's not regular, right? He has the Saturday Review, this massive, you know, mouthpiece that he can spread ideas through. Um, he has a modicum of wealth that allow him to pay for this travel, right? This, this is, he's funding it out of his own pocket. This isn't government funded. Um, but because of his prominence, we do know that it was his position, not as Saturday Review editor, but as a peacemaker, specifically with Sane, that Khrushchev liked. Um, he saw this man as not a partisan, but a man who was working for peace around the world. And that's what opened the door. Um, so those peacemakers that, that Candace talked about, like that's what got him access to Khrushchev. Um, in fact, in 61, before they had met, Khrushchev sent him a personal letter saying like, I like what you're doing, advocating for, for the end of nuclear weapons here. Um, I want to try to do the same thing. I mean, it's it's the Soviets who proposed the testing moratorium back in the, uh, was it 1958, I think. So um, the level of access is remarkable. It is, although, a different time. Um, the a Norman Cousins today, I don't think could get that level of access. Um, and we do know that there are people in America, you know, public and I hesitate sometimes to use the word intellectuals, but public figures, you know, news hosts who do speak directly to the, you know, U.S. president um, on their pet issues. And Cousins' pet issue, thankfully, wasn't tax cuts. It was peace and, and, and nuclear, you know, uh, anti-nuclear issues. But yeah, the, the world is different. It, it is much, you know, larger in a lot of senses today. Um, 
one of the differences, especially is it was very rare for a regular citizen to be able to fly around the world in an era like at the dawn of jet travel and meet with people like that. Um, so when someone popped up, I think leaders were more receptive, less insulated. One of the things Cousins mentioned in, in his writings, his private writings about this trip to the Soviet Union was how lightly guarded Khrushchev was, how like insecure his 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 compound seemed they're not you know he wasn't flanked by secret service agents everywhere and traveling in armored vehicles and he just welcomes them in for lunch with a one lone guard standing at the gate um so yeah the world has changed but it was peacemaker his peacemaker persona that got him this access so maybe that's some 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 hope for the future <laughs> great thank you alan and then, you know, one one more question regarding the Cuban Missile Crisis and also, you know, what's going on today with Ukraine. So, you know, it is a really dangerous time um, since, since the Cuban Missile Crisis, the possibility of nuclear war. What do you think Cousins would recommend to divert that situation today in Ukraine? You know, and, and how do we get to that ceasefire is the second part of that question. Yeah. <laughs> Oof. Uh, this one I, I've grappled with. And I, I I would say this, you know, war changes everything. One of the things that sort of surprised me is that, you know, a, a peacemaker like Cousins actually advocated for World War II, you know, for bombing German cities, um, that if like the Germans wanted us to stop, you know, she can just say that they they brought this on themselves um advocated for the korean war for a different reason thinking that the korean war is the first real test of the united nations that if we can use the un to end this war that will prove the usefulness of world government um of world organizations so in a way you have a pacifist who's arguing for war and you know on, on a personal level i i grapple with teaching, you know, I teach international affairs and, and foreign policy, where I would used to argue that like diplomacy is always the answer here, you know, almost always. But, you know, maybe with the advent of the war in Ukraine, sometimes violent resistance is necessary, uh, as Cousins argued against the Nazis. Um, you know, how would he approach this moment here? I don't know. I really don't know. I think there would be a call for diplomacy. I think he would be using his connections to try to break through because he argued um, even when relations were at their worst that the power of diplomacy can break through. The problem is that requires a receptive negotiating partner. And I'm not sure that you know Putin today is the receptive partner that Khrushchev was in the 60s. I would argue to that questioner like, it's actually maybe more dangerous right now than the Cuban Missile Crisis, because at least Kennedy and Khrushchev wanted to dial this back, kept the line of communication open the entire time. And there's little indication that that's happening. You know, we can call for Biden to, to, to negotiate and, and pursue diplomacy, which I would, and I think Cousins would argue too, but you can't do that when the other side doesn't pick up the phone. Um, so I, I don't know. I guess the answer is I, I, you know, we need more voices like cousins who might have fresh ideas on how to approach this. Great, thank you, Alan. And we still have about ten more minutes for the Q and A. So if you have a question and you haven't typed it into the chat already, um, there is time if you do that now. So another question that came in: um, I've never heard that Eisenhower advocated for world government. Um, could you say a bit more about that and how Norman Cousins interacted with the general and uh, the president, President Eisenhower? Yeah, um, I didn't do a deep dive into Eisenhower's thinking about world government, only there were a number of letters back and forth uh, between Cousins and Eisenhower where Cousins had referenced the fact that like you once supported this um, um, in your memoir, and now you seem not really to support it. I want you to sort of bring this out more. Um, and Eisenhower was afraid, as it had become linked with, if I support world government, I'm supporting like Soviets and communists, uh, was this unfair linkage. Um, but the two men, so uh, uh, that aside, they did, especially in Eisenhower's second term, Eisenhower seemed to be much more open 
Um, as the threat of nuclear weapons grew, especially as we became, we as a nation and a world became more aware of the dangers of radiation, um, which was less clear earlier, you know, in the 40s, um, that one scholar has written that Cousins became Eisenhower's nuclear conscience, that he started pushing them more towards peace. Um, in fact, uh, by 1960, you know, of course, Eisenhower gives his famous military industrial complex speech, you know, dialing back or at least calling to dial back this military spending, even though Eisenhower increased nuclear weapons by some 30,000 over the time he was in office. So, you know, he doesn't get credit for that. But uh, it's 1961, Norman Cousins comes into a windfall of cash when the ownership structure of Saturday Review changes and he cashes in some shares and he spends a million dollars in that in that time, which is you know, way more than that today, um, advocating for peace. He wants to create, I saw someone in the chat box said they, they were advocating for a U.S. Institute for Peace. Cousins wanted to create the George Washington University for Peace, um, funded partly by the U.S. government, that we train, you know, we have all these naval war colleges and, and Air Force War College. We don't have a peace university. Um, that didn't go anywhere. But the point being, he creates this board, he funds these initiatives, and he asks Eisenhower to help advise him um, on these issues. And Eisenhower, they meet a number of times and they talk. Um, um, so they, they do have a close relationship. It's not quite as close as Kennedy and, and Cousins. In fact, Kennedy would ask Cousins to join his administration in 1963. Um, and Cousins says, yes, I will uh, join as like a peace advocate after the limited test ban treaty is signed. Um, and C C Kennedy wants to go more down the route of trying to end the Cold War and dial back the arms race. Cousins takes the job, um, says, I will start January 1st, 1964, because I need to quit the Saturday Review and wrap that down. Um, and then Kennedy is killed in November 1963. Cousins is crushed by this. Um, and then long story short, the Vietnam War breaks out shortly thereafter, and, and things sort of go sideways after that. But um, Cousins and Eisenhower are close. Cousins and Kennedy, uh, well, there's a lot more influence there. <laughs> Great, thank you, Alan. And I have been informed that we have more questions than we could possibly answer in the time we have allotted, which is about five more minutes. So just to let people know that. But I also saw Andrea Cousin's hand. Uh, so I'd like to invite her to get into the conversation. Andrea, and you need to go off mute. I was just going to say that with regard to uh, my father's uh, relationship with Eisenhower, that my father asked him a question about it was something like how 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 do you manage to speak to congress something like that and eisenhower said you just imagine they're all sitting there in their dirty underwear <laughs> great thank you that's uh, a tip that anybody can use <laughs> it's terrific <laughs> thank you okay andrea we have time for another question or two Thank, oh, I think, I oh, think Andrea, Candace I mean. wants to say something, but you're on mute, oh, sure. Candace. We can't hear you. Absolutely, yes. Right. Any of the panelists can respond to these questions. Right. Go ahead, Candace. I, I, just, I just wanted <clears throat> to say, because I really thought a lot about uh, what Daddy would say now for us to do. And I think he would tell, I think he would tell us to write letters and to, get people together and write letters all the time to Biden and to people in Congress um, and never to underestimate the power of that. I think that he would, I, I imagine that he would make a path to, to meet with Biden and to talk with Biden the way that he talked with Kennedy and Eisenhower and show that, Biden, that Biden has an opportunity to, to really rise above and to be a, and to be a, a peace leader, that the, the, the United States can be a leader in peace, and that this would be something that Biden would want in his, in his legacy. And, and he would appeal to um, Biden's essential, authentic morality. Um, so I do feel that he would make it happen. 
You know, my father was so creative. He would have found a way to get to Biden. It, and, and Alan, I, I, I think everything you're saying about um, the, uh, how hard it is these days to do what my father did. But despite that, my father often spoke about how he knew how isolated leaders were. They were, they've always been isolated. Kennedy was isolated, Khrushchev was isolated, um, but there is a way and he would find it. Um, so uh, those are just a couple of my ideas. Great, thank you, Candice. Drea, it looks like we have time for one more question. So the last question here, um, and we've talked a little bit about this, um, but it, is it possible to have a peaceful world only by working at the organizational and governmental levels without this widespread personal and cultural peacefulness? Hmm. That's a good one. Uh, I mean, personally, I would say this. So I grew up in Canada where Canada has a very different relationship with its military than the United States does. Um, and then I moved to the US um, and was shocked about how like militaristic everything is, everywhere you look, all the time, always. It was really unsettling. And then I spoke, uh, a friend of mine from Germany came to the US uh, for the first time ever and went, um, was, he was visiting a, an archive in Texas and was told to like, oh, you want like a real Texas experience, go to a college football game. And he did and was really off put by the military flyover and the salute the troops and all of this was like came back kind of shaken by that um especially like as a german especially um and i it was something i felt too so the the, the, the reason i'm saying this is that question of like can we build a peaceful world without changing culture no i don't think i mean not no but i think the culture comes along with this when you have a militaristic culture or a militaristic leader that's going to push uh, the public thinking which is why i think it's so important that when you had a norman cousins in charge of like the at a time the third largest news magazine in the country pushing the opposite of militarism pushing a peaceful culture that eventually will get in people's heads right it wins you know hearts and minds it wins influence and i think pushed a good portion of the American public to come to realize the dangers of nuclear weapons. He was leading on this before other magazines, before other you know, public information at the time. So cultural shifts are, I think, crucial. Like this idea of what all you do from the bottom up is just as important, if not more so, than you know trying to advocate from the top down, which is hits roadblocks all the time. Oh, that's all my piece. <laughs> Great. Thank you, Alan. At this time, I'd like to check to see if any of the other panelists have any closing comments. Then we'll turn to Drea, who will say a few words about CGS's programs and campaigns, and then we'll wrap up. So any final comments from the rest of the panel? No pressure. <laughs> OK. Well, hearing none, we can certainly wrap up at, at this point. I want to thank all of our panelists for this, their wonderful presentations, heartfelt sharing, authentic communication from the heart and soul, uh, and of course, for all the work you've been doing over all these years. Um, so thank you. You're welcome to stay, or if you need to get on with your peacekeeping, you can, you can do that at this time. Um, at this point, I want to turn to uh, Drea, who's going to say a few words about our programs and campaigns. So Drea, you have the floor. Okay, so I'm just going to share my screen. Can everyone see? Yes. Uh, everything that's up? Okay, hold on just a moment. Uh, and you can only see the presenter screen, I hope? Yes. Okay, fantastic. So uh, let me start from the beginning here. Uh, before, I, I just have a moment. Uh, and it's just going to be just a brief introduction here of our programs and campaigns. But I'm actually feeling quite emotional after Alan and Candace's um, uh, talk today. So 
I just wanted to start by saying that the reason I'm doing the work, the reason I love doing this work, because it's such a privilege to be able to take our mission and be able to put that into action. I think it's absolutely critical that we engage, we learn, we reflect, but then collectively, we need to create these inclusive spaces for us to come together and make this world a better place. So that's why I'm just so thrilled and excited to be here to reflect on Norman's life, to be connected with you, Alan, with Candace, with Andrea, with Peace Action, and all of you. And I have so much hope and so much optimism that we actually can come together, we can raise our voices, and we can solve these big global problems that we face. So investing in youth programming, and we've talked about this a little bit today here, is really critical for CGS in the coming years. We need to create opportunities for young people to learn, to be empowered, to become leaders. Um, and these are just two programs that we have launched this fall in collaboration with World Service Authority and Young World Federalists. So the Unite the World Conference, which was centered around Week for World Parliament, was actually in New York City last weekend. Young people were able to learn about the UN, get involved in ways to make it more democratic, more workable. They were able to learn about World Federation. They had this opportunity to network and most importantly, to take action. The World Citizen Club was also launched this fall and again in partnership with the World Service Authority and Young World Federalists. And it's being piloted right now at George Mason University in Washington, DC. So just for a little bit of context, being a world citizen is one of our goals and values because it's this recognition of universal human rights and responsibilities within our communities. So we really want everyone to think of themselves as world citizens. We want people to build community and advocate for world peace, protecting the environment, engaging in world law. So being a world citizen is not a passive thing. It's about building community of like-minded advocates to take action. So in the future, I want to see this program expanded to colleges and universities all across the country, have this running in high school. I would love to see an adult world citizen clubs as well. So this is just year one. I would love to see youth programming continue to grow and expand here at CGS. And our book club is CGS's longest running program. And to my knowledge, we're the only organization dedicated to taking this really deep dive into World Federation, its history, its models, and its values. And currently we're reading Union Now, published in uh, 1939, which is uh, very apropos for today's times. We just finished the third out of five sessions. So um, we do go into two books. We read two books per year and they're both historical and contemporary. If you're interested in joining, our next session is November 10th, 2.30 to 4 p.m. Eastern time. It's free, it's virtual, so just be sure to connect with us. And this year's annual conference, uh, also virtual, also free, and we're going to be taking a closer look at the five models of global governance. So if you haven't signed up, again, connect with us. Um, it's November 10th through the 12th. And our campaigns in the coming months will focus on engaging Americans around the International Criminal Court or ICC for short, and why the ICC matters. You know, let's build this better world and join this global fight for global justice on all of these atrocities committed by individuals. So the ICC is our only international independent judicial system that's able to prosecute individuals for war crimes, crimes against humanity and genocide. So now is the time to be bold and we will be launching these campaigns in the coming months. And I just hear uh, Candace in my head now, right, right, right. You know, so if you want to get involved in these campaigns, again, uh, connect with us. So be sure, you know, find us on social media, like and follow us. Uh, more importantly, if you're really interested in, in volunteering, uh, participating in our programs, uh, please connect with us. Uh, I just want to say again, my hope and optimism runs through with everything that I do. And with your support, we can continue to grow our programming and outreach. I really want to fulfill our mission of peace. 
So I will be putting a Google site in the chat after I'm finished. So you can let us know uh, your thoughts on the programming today. Again, connect with us um, and take action. And I also have included peace action in there. Um, so you can get uh, connected with their local chapter of peace action as well. Thank you so much. Great, and thank you, Drea. And that brings us to the close of our event. So I wanna thank, first of all, the production crew of Donna Park and Drea Bergman for all the work they did to make this happen. And our panelists, Alan Pietro, Candace Cousins, and Larry Whitner for bringing the work of Norman Cousins to life in such a wonderful way. And to all of you who attended for the work you're doing to make this a more peaceful planet. So please check out our website, globalsolutions.org, and also come back later in the year as we're going live with our redesigned website, which will have both much more information, our latest activities, and a video library. Also, like most nonprofits, we depend on public support. So if you like the work we do, you can make a tax deductible contribution at our website. So thank you all and see you next time. Bye bye now.